Okay, good morning everybody. This morning we're going to finish off, first of all, the example that I was trying to finish off last time and ran out of time because of the various technical difficulties we were having. Hopefully those don't repeat themselves. We were um, looking at BF3 and constructing the MO diagram for that. This is our second to last example. So we're going to do this one, finish this one up quickly, and then move on to looking at sigma bonding and octahedral complexes, which is a very important case of MO diagram building. And finally, after that, we'll move into the next chapter, which is chapter seven, okay, the solid state, solid state chemistry. So we were basically here last time, before I had to kind of rush to finish things up, where we constructed the group orbitals from the three outer fluorines. Remember, we have 12 total orbitals there. And we have four orbitals from the borons. And we had assigned all of the irreducible representations. And we'd indicated which are going to be expected to have interactions based on symmetry. So we expect to have interactions between the A1 primes, the E primes, and the A2 primes. Three of the group orbitals are without symmetry matching pair on the center atom orbital, and so those are going to be non-bonding. This looks complicated, right? We have 16 total orbitals that we're looking at, but it's actually fairly simple. So one thing that we can know right away is based on fluorine, the two S's are not going to interact hardly at all with the, with the, uh, central, uh, the central boron. So these three orbitals here are going to be primarily non-bonding. And then I also mentioned that we have a situation in these two orbitals here coming out of the px orbitals, where we have very little orbital overlap with the center atom. So actually in the previous class, there was a mistake in these two orbitals. They were switched. Okay? And so I corrected this mistake here. And now you can see that if you try to line up and overlap the E prime from the y, from the center atom boron, with E prime here, you see very little overlap. This lobe points away from the um, lobes on the group orbital, and the other lobe that points toward sort of is um, moving in the same direction as those group atom orbitals. <coughs> and so there's very little interaction here, and this is a similar thing with this particular interaction. We have a pi-like interaction with the center atom and this lobe, but then it's kind of canceled out by the interactions with those two lobes. And so this set of orbitals here, the px's, are also going to be mostly non-bonding. Okay? So we're going to have five non-bonding orbitals, and we're going to have four bonding and antibonding interactions in this particular case. Okay? And this is just a regurgitation of what the energies look like from this, from this particular molecule. Again, the fluorine 2s's are way too deep in energy to interact. That's why these are all going to be non-bonding orbitals from the 2s's. And so we ended here last time by constructing the MO diagram. Boron on the left, group orbitals on the right. And I've indicated the various symmetries in different colors. Okay? The red colors indicate orbitals that we expect to have bonding and antibonding pairs. The grayed out orbitals are those that are going to be non-bonding. Okay? And this black one here is going to be mostly non-bonding. And this is the one from the two PXs that's going to have very poor overlap with the center um, atom orbitals. And so when we go to construct the diagram, we always start with sigma, then move to pi. We start at the bottom, we move to the top. And so the first three orbitals here that are two s's come across as non-bonding because they're way too far away from, in energy from the borons. And then we look at sigma orbitals. Okay? We have an interaction between the A1 prime and the A1 prime that's here, bonding and antibonding. This is clearly a sigma type interaction. Next up is we can look at the E prime set. Okay? So the E primes here are going to interact with the red E primes here. And you're going to get two orbitals low, two orbitals high. Remember, the E orbitals always have degenerate, uh, de de degeneracy of two. And these are from, of course, the PY lobes in the outer atoms. Okay? So you get bonding, and you get the corresponding anti-bonding sigma type interactions. And finally, the only other orbital that we need to look at, look at here is the A2 prime, double prime. And this is the PZ. Right? And so we're going to have a pi type interaction between the PZ on the, on the center atom and the PZs on the outer atoms. Okay. And that's going to give us bonding and antibonding interactions, of course. That accounts for all of the bonding and antibonding interactions. The remaining orbitals are just going to be non-bonding. And so we have uh, three that are totally non-bonding and these two here that are primarily non-bonding because of poor overlap. And so they're going to come over in the diagram and we're going to form five more orbitals there. Okay, so these two are the mostly non-bonding, and these are the totally non-bonding by symmetry. We have 24 electrons, 21 from the fluorines, 3 from the boron. So we have 24 total electrons to fill up. That's where they fill. 
They fill all the way up, and the highest occupied molecular orbital is going to be this non-bonding set of orbitals. The lowest unoccupied molecular orbital is this pi star. Okay? And this is where the chemistry for boron trifluoride will happen. What can we learn? Well, we have five non-bonding electron pairs here. We have three non-bonding pairs here, so that's eight total non-bonding pairs. And we have basically three sigma bonds and one pi bond. Okay? So we have three sigma bonds. That's what we would expect in boron trifluoride. But the, the molecular orbital diagram tells us a little bit more. It tells us that there's some pi bonding character in this molecule too. And so a nice way to draw it would be something that looks like this, right? where we have eight non-bonding sets on the fluorines, and then we have three sigma plus a pi bond. And of course, it's a resonance structure. Right? And so it gives us a, a very nice, clean example of a, a bent atom with more than two um, atoms in the group orbitals. All right. Any questions about boron trifluoride? Uh, do you ever put in uh, formal charges? You can, yeah. That, that diagram would be more complete with the formal charges present. Yeah. So the more stabilized non-bonding, the To the actual sigma interactions and the pi interactions? Oh, the non-bonding, these ones. Okay, so to look at that, we have to go back to the uh, group orbital uh, diagrams that we had. So let's go back. Hopefully we don't have too much trouble doing that. And they are here, these two. Yep. These two that have poor overlap with the center atom are those that are going to be almost non-bonding. Yep. Perhaps a little bit difficult to see, but if you um, did a calculation of the actual integral, you'd find that it's very small. Okay, other questions about this example? Okay, if not, the final example that we're gonna talk about deals with d orbitals. This is the first time we're gonna talk about d orbital interactions, and so we need to remember what d orbitals look like. Um, hopefully almost everybody does, but just in case, there's a uh, refresher here. Remember that the d orbitals are defined as having an angular momentum quantum number of two, right? So S is zero, P is one, D is two. And the number of orbitals you can have is 2L plus 1. So in this case, we have five d orbitals. And so we have space for 10 electrons. Okay. These are the real function forms of, um, the real valued functional forms of the d orbitals. Right, so we have the d, y, z, x, z, and, and x, y. And these have lobes that are pointed between the Cartesian coordinate axes. Okay. The shading isn't indicated, but basically it's positive, negative, positive, negative. It's just alternating sign on the lobes. So we have these that are pointed between the Cartesian axes, and then we have the x squared minus y squared, which has lobes pointed directly along the x and the y axes. And we have the funny looking dz squared, which has a lobe, primarily a big fat lobe that points along the z axis, and then a ring of opposite polarity in the xy plane. Okay. So these are the five d orbitals that we'll need to worry about whenever we start talking about molecular building involving, say, metal atoms right, that have like transition metal atoms that have active d orbitals. So let's look at the most important single example of a transition metal complex, a molecule which has a metal at the center of it, metal atom, we could call it, let's say, iron, just for simplicity. And there's some ligands, some groups that attach to the metal. And in this case, it's an octahedral complex, meaning that there are six ligands equally spaced painting out the corners of an octahedron. We have point group OH, and this is one of the you know, high symmetry point groups that we talked about, um, say, six or eight classes ago. In these kinds of octahedral complexes, you can have, in principle, lots of different types of bonding. You can have sigma bonding, you can have pi bonding, you can have delta bonding, other things. Um, in this case, what we're going to do is just look at the sigma bonds. So remember, the sigma bonds are those that have electron density between the two nuclei along the internuclear axis and no nodes parallel with the internuclear axis. Okay. So later on, um, you will talk about pi bonding also in complexes. It's very important. But for now, just the sigma picture will be enough. So if we want to um, understand the MO diagram, what we have to do is consider the bond vectors, the six bond vectors, from the individual ligands to the metal center. Right? These are just sigma bonds, so we can just look at how the symmetry of these individual bond vectors is going to play out. And what you can see right away, and you can imagine, is that you're going to have sigma interactions between the orbitals that, of course, have sigma-like character along these three Cartesian coordinates. 
So the dz squared is this orbital here. It's going to have interactions with ligands that are coming in in a sigma type fashion along the z-axis, right? So that they have electron density along the internuclear axis. The ones in the x and the y, right, like these in the, along the equator here, are going to interact with the x squared minus y squared orbital because that orbital, shown here, has lobes that point directly along the x-axis and directly along the y-axis. Okay. So we expect right away that the main sigma type interactions from the d orbitals are going to come from the dz squared and the x squared minus y squared. If you talk about pi interactions, then you talk about some of the other d orbitals, the other three, right, the xy, the xz, and the yz. And that's because pi type interactions would come in with ligands like this. This is just showing four ligands interacting with the center metal orbital here. And this is, let's say, the xy, the dxy orbital. Okay. Nice and you can see that you have interaction with all these, all these four ligands here. Okay. The, x, the xy, xz, yz orbitals, that set of three orbitals is appropriate for pi bonding, but it does not sigma bond. Those orbitals are incapable of sigma bonding because if you imagine having a sigma type lobe coming in here, you can see that the interaction with the center metal atom is going to be precisely zero by symmetry. Okay. And so what we want to do is formalize this by using the character tables in our normal procedure. And we'll quickly show what the basic MO diagram is for sigma bonding in uh, octahedral complexes. So here's our coordinate uh, system. What we want to do is bring up the octahedral character table. It's enormous, right, because there are so many symmetry operations in it. But uh, don't be frightened. It's not, not a big deal. A lot of information, of course, is right at your fingertips. So what we want to do is we want to take the octahedral diagram and we want to build a reducible representation for the sigma bond vectors, right? the six sigma bond vectors. And the most convenient way to do that, if you have the character table, is just to make your reducible representation right underneath it so that all the you know, columns line up and it's easy to do. Okay? So here is our reducible representation. This is reducible for the sigma type interactions. That's what that sub sigma means. And we just march across the classes of operations and you know, determine what the character is for each operation. So under E, it's six because we have six unchanged vectors. Um, you can convince yourself under a C3 and a C2, this particular type of C2, everything moves, et cetera, et cetera. If you have a C4 uh, axis, say along this way here, these two bond vectors don't change, but the other four do, and so you get a character of two. I'm sure at this point, that we can construct this reducible representation fairly easily. The only uh, strange thing about this is to realize that this C2 here, this C2 axis, this six set, these uh, six different C2 axes, are bisecting all of the atoms. They're not passing through any of the atoms. It's these C2s here that are passing through the atoms. Okay? So that is a potential point of confusion. But because this C2 passes between the atoms, all of the atoms move when we, when we do that particular operation. Okay. So this gives us our reducible representation for the sigma type interactions we expect in an octahedral complex. We reduce it, and what we find if we do our reduction uh, procedure is that we have an A1G, an EG, and a T1U set. Okay? This is six different group orbitals because there's one here, there's two here, this is a two by two matrix, and this is a three by three matrix. So there's three orbitals in that T set. Okay? So singly degenerate, doubly degenerate, triply degenerate. Okay. Now what we want to do is look at the possible symmetry matching with the center atom. Okay. So we bring up here our reducible representation. We look again at the character table. Let's think about how this is going to interact with the center atom. Okay. We can see that the group orbitals match the metal s orbital. Okay. This a1g is the same symmetry as an s orbital. Okay. That's this one up here, totally symmetric. And so we expect an interaction between the a1g ligand set and the s orbital on the metal. Okay. We have to worry about S, P, and D orbitals for metals. So we have nine total orbitals that we need to look at. We have interactions between the metal P orbitals and the group orbitals. Okay? The metal P orbitals are shown here, X, Y, and Z. That corresponds to P, X, P, Y, and P, Z. That's the T1U, and that's the same thing that we've got in our reducible representation. So the T1U set from the ligands is going to interact with the P orbitals on the metal. And then finally, if we look at the last one that we've got, the EG set, which is here, okay, it has the symmetry of Z squared. This is the um, fully written out functional form for the DZ squared orbital. And it has X squared minus Y squared. And so the DZ squared and the X squared minus Y squared are going to interact with those two group atom orbitals. Okay. So that takes care of the S orbital, the P orbitals on the metal, and two of the D orbitals. 
We have three remaining d orbitals on the metal. What are they going to do? Well, the remaining d orbitals are shown here, x, y, x, z, y, z. They have an irreducible representation of T2G, and there's no symmetry match on the ligand orbitals for sigma interactions for, um, with, with that particular irreducible representation. So the T2G, those three d, or, d orbitals on the metal, are just going to come across as non-bonding orbitals. Okay? There's no sigma interactions with those orbitals. And that right away accounts for what the picture should look like. We should have three orbitals that are non-bonding, and then we should have bonding and anti-bonding pairs for the others. Okay. What do they look like physically, right, if we actually determined the formula for the, the molecular orbitals? Well, we can do that in principle using the projection operator method, which we're not going to do explicitly. All we're going to do is just show the results, okay? But you could use the projection operator method plus um, the conditions of normalization to determine what all of these functional forms must be. Okay. So let's just look at the results. These are the so-called ligand six, you know, the outer ligands, the six ligands in the octahedral complex, symmetry adapted linear combinations. <clears throat> and what we have is we have the three different groups, right? We have the A1G, totally symmetric. That just must be a linear sum of all of the six ligands. And so it looks like this. Here's the metal A1G, it's the S orbital on the metal. Here is the ligand A1G. It has just equal lobes from all six different ligands coming in. And I've just labeled them there for, for convenience because we're going to use this in a second. Okay. So you can see that overlapping this with that is going to give us a nice sigma and sigma star interaction. Okay. What about the T1Us? Well, the T1U symmetry adapted linear combinations are going to be 1 minus 3 or 2 minus 4 or 5 minus 6. Those are the three possibilities. And why is that? It's because the metal has you know, px, py, and pz orbitals. And in order to interact with those, the ligands have to come in and just use two ligands each. Okay? And that gives you an interaction that's sigma interaction using the p orbitals. Okay? And so you can see that if you interact the, this p orbital from the metal with this group orbital from the ligands, you get, of course, bonding and antibonding combinations. Okay? These are the correct symmetries the same symmetries as these, that's why they're, of course, labeled the same, T1U. And the projection operator method could allow us to determine that that's the correct form for those three. Finally, we have the EG set. These two orbitals here that come in from the ligands and that um, are going to be the DZ squared and X squared minus Y squared orbitals from the metal. What do they look like? Well, of course, we know what the metal orbitals look like. There's the DZ squared, the X squared minus Y squared. The proper symmetry adapted linear combinations are shown here 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4, that's this one. So if we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 minus plus minus. Okay. And that gives us proper symmetry to interact with the x squared minus y squared quite clearly. The funky one, of course, is related to the funky looking d orbital, which is the dz squared. Right? And it comes in as 2 times 6, 2 times 5, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. So here's 5 and 6. These lobes are going to be twice as big as the others and have the opposite sign of those in the middle. And that has to be true in, in order to interact with the dz squared because, of course, we have the same sort of coloration, the same sort of sign in the dz squared. The lobes on the ends, the same sign, and the ring in the middle, the opposite sign. Okay. And so these are going to be the symmetry adapted linear combinations that we will interact to make the sigma type orbitals um, in the molecule. What about the T2Gs, the X squared, or the, sorry, the XY, XZ, and YZ? Well, they look like this, right? This is a T2G set based on the character table. And you can see here, when I try to interact one of these orbitals with one ligand coming in in a sigma type fashion, you can see right away that there's zero interaction, right? This interaction is negative and precisely canceled out by that one, and the same for the lobes in the back. Okay? And so that's why this T2G set is not um, sigma anything, it's sigma non-bonding. Okay, so what does the MO diagram look like? It looks like this. Always, we have the metal or the center atom on the left. Here's the donors on the right. Okay, this is the ligand group on the right. We have from the ligands the EG, the T1U, and the A1G. And we have the metal um, atomic orbitals, the Ds. Here's the five D orbitals. Here's the S orbital, and here's the P orbitals with their corresponding irreducible representations painted on. So we expect an A1G interaction between the A1G group orbital and the S orbital. That gives us a pretty strong sigma bond and a pretty strong antibond. Okay. Little A1G, little A1G star. 
<clears throat> we can look at the um, P orbital interactions, the T1U set, with the T1U set from the metal. Okay? And what we have is we're going to have um, you know, some interaction that gives us bonding, and then the antibonding has got to be above the original atomic orbitals from the metal. Okay? So we have our T1U and T1U star. And then the last one that we have actual bonding and antibonding is the EG set, right? the D orbitals on the metal here, interacting with the EG set from the ligands. We're going to continue to have a doubly degenerate set of orbitals, bonding and antibonding. The amount of bonding and antibonding depends, of course, on the energy difference between the orbitals being quite different and the overlap between the orbitals being different. Right? So the overlap between the A1Gs is going to be quite a lot different than between the EGs. Okay? And that's why the particular order of orbitals is what it is. Okay? Finally, we have the three orbitals that are non-bonding on the metal. They just come across the diagram and make a T2G set. Okay? Now, what do we do for electron filling here? Typically, when you have um, ligands coming in as uh, sigma interacting ligands, they have a lone pair of electrons that they're essentially giving to the bond. Okay? So they come in with all of these orbitals here full. Okay? There's six ligands. <clears throat> Each of them comes in with a, a lone pair. So that's 12 electrons that are going to sit there. The electrons that are present on the metal just depends on what particular metal we're, talk we're talking about and what the oxidation state is of the metal. We're just going to show an example here where we have five electrons in the d orbitals. Okay? It doesn't really matter what it is. So here's our particular um, complex, you know, just a generic complex here with d5 or five electrons in the d orbitals. These 12 electrons here fill up immediately these bonding orbitals. Okay? 12 electrons get dumped into there. And so you can, in a sense, think about what happens to the d electrons as a kind of a last thing. The d electrons, in this case, we have them just coming right over and piling up in the T2G set of orbitals. Okay. So we have five d electrons, and they sit in this non-bonding set of orbitals. And so in this particular case, <clears throat> as in most um, d complexes that are octahedral, we have the, uh, or as in many, I wouldn't say most, so the HOMO here is the T2G, and the LUMO is an antibonding EG star set. What we're going to find later is that depending on the size of this energy difference here between the T2G and the EG star, we can have electrons actually that would, pe that would prefer to exist in the EG star set. And so we can have a distribution uh, within the T2G and the EG star, depending on the size of this so-called delta octahedral parameter, or this uh, splitting parameter between the non-bonding and the anti-bonding orbitals. These frontier orbitals dictate a lot of the chemistry of the, molecular, of the uh, octahedral complexes. And so what you'll see very, very commonly um, in the latter part of the class is this set of orbitals here, 2 over 3. That's the characteristic of an octahedral complex, metal complex. Okay. And so we were, within about five minutes, able to get from just symmetry considerations <clears throat> an idea about how the molecular orbital diagram looks for these complexes. And you'll see this quite a lot, especially when you're talking uh, chapters 9 through <clears throat> 12 or so. Okay. Any questions about this? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Only sigma? This is only sigma bonding. Yeah. When you start including pi bonding, then you can imagine that the uh, T2G set is going to start interacting with the ligands. And you're going to get changes in the diagram. So the T2G set will go up, it'll go down, there'll be various things that happen. Yeah, in the back. That's right. Yeah, the symmetry of the T2G, you know, by definition, because we call them T2G, they don't have any part partners on the, uh, uh, on the ligand set, right? So they're non-bonding. Yep. Um, without looking at the images from the previous two slides, would we be able to determine um, which molecular orbital would be the lowest one among A1, B, and C? Um, generally speaking, it's going to be the A1G because you've got six ligands coming in and interacting with the s orbital. Some of the other, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to just say without um, having a little bit more information. But the other orbital interactions, if you look at them, have fewer ligands interacting. right? And they have also, you have to always consider the energy difference between the atomic orbitals and the group orbitals. And those are different from the d to the p and the s. So, it's a combination of all these things that leads to the order. But generally speaking, <clears throat> yeah, the A1G is going to be deepest, and then, um, then the EG, right? 
and then so and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions about this? You will be very familiar with octahedral complexes by the end of this class. Right? Octahedral complexes and the other important class are tetrahedral and square planar complexes. Those will be the main um, the main kinds of molecules you talk about when you talk about coordination chemistry. Okay. So let's finish finally molecular orbital theory in chapter five. <clears throat> so we've shown that you can build MO diagrams by considering the molecule in two pieces, a center atom and a group, a set of group atoms. Okay? So you generate group orbitals. And then we consider their symmetries and their energies to determine how to build the diagram. The symmetry of the group orbitals is determined by always reducing a reducible representation when we need to. In some cases, when the molecule is really simple, we don't need to do all this stuff. And so you can just do it by what we've called inspection. But the um, more rigorous procedure is to reduce a reducible representation for whatever bonds you're talking about, okay, whatever interactions you're, you're interested in. And in order to form the wave functions properly, we can use this method that we introduced called the projection operator method. Okay, so this is quite powerful method for getting the um, molecular orbitals or the group orbitals correct. And then matching them up with the center atom orbital. And we did a number of examples over the last four or five lectures. Okay, we started with homonuclear diatomics, then we moved into HF and CO, then we went to triatomic molecules like H3 plus and our other ion here, and then CO2, H2O, BF3, and our sigma bonding ML6, where M is a metal and L is a ligand. So a fairly um, fast but comprehensive approach to looking at uh, the possibilities in, in uh, kind of simple molecular orbital pictures. High symmetry, low numbers of atoms, equal numbers of, you know, the same kind of, uh, of atoms on the, on the outer atoms. Do we have any questions at all about uh, MO theory before we move forward? Okay. Okay. So the next um, topic in the class <clears throat> is related to what we've just talked about. It's a little bit of a diversion. Uh, we're going to discuss crystals, okay? solid state chemistry, a little bit of solid state physics. Why do this now? Well, actually, looking at crystals, it's a natural extension of molecular orbital theory, which we've focused so far just on molecules. You can use MO theory or a version of it to look at the electronic structure of um, <clears throat> bulk materials. You know, crystalline materials, solid state materials. Okay. And so it's, it's nice in that sense that it's a nice continuation of MO theory. It's also um, an incredibly important area in chemistry these days. So solid state chemistry has enormous technological applications and enormous diversity in properties. Um, so I think it'll be uh, fairly interesting to you guys. It's also something you probably haven't seen much of, if, uh, if any at all. Okay. So we're going to cover um, some of the basics, but go well beyond anything that you've seen in general chemistry. So, crystalline solid state. <clears throat> the distinction that we need to make at the beginning here, okay, there are lots of different kinds of solids, of course, and we're going to focus on crystals rather than the other kind of solid, which is called an amorphous solid. This is kind of the other end member of the spectrum of crystallinity. So we have amorphous solids and we have crystalline solids. Amorphous solids are solids that don't have a regular three-dimensional arrangement of atoms. Okay? In other words, they, la they lack long-range structural order. They lack long-range periodicity in the atoms. So periodicity is the key concept here. One example, a very important type of amorphous solid is glass. Okay, this is another way to actually say amorphous, is to call it a glass. And one of the most important glasses, of course, is just SiO2, right? which is the basis for almost all the glass that is uh, common around us. SiO2 glass has an interaction between silicon and oxygen. Right? But if you look at it, the silicon and oxygen bond angles and bond lengths have a distribution. And there's no order, long range order, in this sort of material. Okay? There's distributions in the bond lengths, which you can see around, and there's distribution in the bond angles. The individual bonding unit is the same. It's an SiO4 tetrahedron, right? but it's not a crystal. It's an amorphous solid because it does not have long range order. Contrast that with another type of SiO2, which we would call quartz. In this case, 
This particular quartz is called alpha quartz. This is an example of the same stuff, but crystallized, a crystalline version of it. What is a crystal? A crystal is a solid that is either of atoms or ions or molecules that has long range periodicity. Okay, the atoms are arranged in a certain set pattern, and that gives them certain properties that are different than amorphous solids. And for us, it's very important that the periodicity allows us to apply molecular orbital theory to understand the electronic structure of these solids in a way that you can't do with an amorphous solid so easily. So why would certain materials crystallize? Um, it's often to minimize free energy. Okay. So many times if you heat a solid up and give it enough time for the atoms to move around, um, you will actually generate a crystalline form of that material. Okay. You cool it down very slowly and you can get a nice crystal out. The way to form a glass, typically, an amorphous solid is to heat something up maybe till its melting point and then cool it very quickly. This is a common way to do this. And by cooling it very fast, you prevent, you don't give the atoms enough time to find their equilibrium spots and they kind of freeze in and they make an amorphous solid of glass. Okay. So one of the ways that SiO2 glass and SiO2 crystals are different is the amount of time that one takes in making them. So quartz, of course, very commonly found in nature, right? And so you're talking about very long cooling periods. And so it gives the beautiful, you know, the time for beautiful crystals to form. When we talk about crystalline solids, since it's a periodic solid, we can break the crystal down into what's called a unit cell. The unit cell is the simplest unit that if we reproduce it, if we translate it through all space, it generates the entire crystal without any overlaps or without any voids. The unit, cell, the unit cells that we're going to talk about also have the full crystal symmetry. So if the crystal is cubic, right, if it has A, B, and C sides the same length, and if all the angles are 90 degrees, then the unit cell is also going to be cubic. Okay? It retains the full crystal symmetry. Okay. The types of crystalline solids are vast, right? So solid state chemistry is an enormous, enormous field. But some of the general types that we can think about are things that are pretty familiar like ionic crystals. So salt, for example, is a great example of uh, ionic crystal. Covalent or network crystals. So covalent crystal, for example, silicon, right? Or graphite, things like this. Molecular crystals, of course, you can have crystals that are built up of molecules. So you can have solid benzene that's crystalline. You can have um, you know, solid proteins that are crystals. Right? So you can generate an ordered arrangement of proteins in a, in a three-dimensional structure, and that would be a crystalline protein. You can generate metallic crystals. So iron, lead, whatever it might be. Right? There are um, very commonly crystalline forms of these. And then quite interesting are if you freeze noble gases in the right way, you can generate noble gas crystals. Right? So these are crystals that are um, formed by van der Waals interactions, very weakly um, interacting units, and it leads to crystals only, of course, at very, very low temperature. <coughs> so just some general classes of crystals. When we talk about crystals, this is kind of the landscape that we're talking about. There are seven different ways, seven different crystal systems that um, any crystal that we find that's a true crystal will, um, will adopt one of these crystal systems. So all three-dimensional crystals are going to belong to one of these. And so let, let's walk through the different possibilities. Okay? So we have cubic, tetrahedral, uh, tetragonal, sorry, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, rhombohedral, and hexagonal are the, are the seven different possibilities. Let's start with cubic. So a cubic crystal is one where A, B, and C, the lengths of the unit cell edges, are all the same. And the angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, between the different... Uh, the different axes are all 90 degrees. Okay. Cubic crystals are the easiest for us to kind of uh, you know, understand at the beginning and also incredibly important class of crystals. So there are many very um, important classes or types of cubic crystals including things like silicon. Okay. So technologically very important. If we take a cube and we just stretch it along one direction, we generate a tetragon or where we have A is equal to B, but not equal to C anymore, but all the angles are still 90. Okay. So we have a tetragonal crystal if we just pull a cube in one direction along a face. Okay. If we then take an uh, uh, orthogonal direction and change that direction as well, that length, then we generate a shoebox. 
right, where A, B, and C are not equal, but all angles are still 90. This is called an orthorhombic crystal, the orthorhombic crystal class, or crystal system. Okay. So cube, distorted cube, right, by pulling one direction, and then orthorhombic is a shoebox. The other thing that we can do is we can start applying shear forces to the cube and distort it in one direction or another. If we take our shoebox, our orthorhombic crystal, and we shear, we put a shear force on one side of the shoebox, we're going to distort one of the angles, okay? And we generate what's called a monoclinic crystal system. This is where we have A and B and C all different, and we have Alpha and beta equal to 90, but gamma not equal to 90, because what we've done is we've deformed the shoebox by pushing it in one direction, holding the bottom, holding the top, and distorting it like that, putting force on it. That gives us a monoclinic. The other thing we can do is we can do another shear force in a different direction. Okay, so we take our monoclinic crystal, and then we apply a shear force in an opposite direction, right? perpendicular direction. That generates then a triclinic crystal where we have all lengths different and all angles not equal 90. Okay. So that's the heavily distorted shoebox. Okay. okay, so that's enough of our distortions of the shoebox. If we go back to our cube, if we go back to our cube here, and we pull along a body diagonal, if I grab that, that point, for example, and grab at that point, and pull the cube, stretch the cube, or push the cube, compress the cube, I generate the rhombohedral crystal system, okay. where A, B, and C are the same, okay, but none of the angles are equal to 90. So that's the cube that's been stretched or compressed. And those are seven, or sorry, six crystal systems that we can generate from the cube. Okay. And those are all the possibilities of, of uh, unique possibilities for crystal systems. The seventh crystal system is not related to cube, but it's related to the hexagon. So you can have a hexagonal crystal system in which you have A and B along the, the bottom plane here, for example, the same, C different, okay, the length of the hexagonal prism different, and we have A and B equal to 90, or sorry, alpha and beta equal to 90, but gamma equal to 120 degrees, 120 because of the hexagonal symmetry. This is the seventh and final crystal system that one can find crystals in. And this rounds out the possibilities. These seven crystal systems are kind of shown here again. Okay? All the 3D crystals belong to one of seven crystal systems and one of 14 what are called Brave lattices. Okay? This is a very important concept in solid state chemistry, the Brave lattice. And there are 14 different Brave lattices. Each of the Brave lattices exists in one of the crystal systems. So it's like a subdivision of the crystal system idea. What is a Brave lattice? This is um, named after a mathematician okay, who figured this all out in the uh, 19th century, perhaps even a little before that. A Brave lattice is an interesting geometric concept. Okay? So it's an infinite array of points. This is a three-dimensional lattice of points okay, where the orientation from each point, if I stood on any, any point of the lattice, my world looks the same. Okay? The orientation looks exactly the same from any lattice point. And so if we look at the possible ways that you can have this, uh, this uh, to be true, okay, where you can have all of your lattice points uh, with the same exact orientation, it turns out there's only 14 different ways to do that. Three of those ways are present in the cubic crystal system. Okay? So we can have a simple cube, a face-centered cube, where we have lattice points in these blue lattice points here, which are at the face centers of the six different faces of the cube. Or we can have a body-centered cube where we have a lattice point right in the middle of the cube. If you think about mentally just expanding this simple cube, translating it, reproducing it in all different directions to build up a huge number of these simple cubes that are all connected, you can see that from whatever lattice point you stand on, the world around you looks exactly the same. It's pretty simple to do with the simple cube. With the face-centered cube, it's a little bit more difficult to see it. But if you mentally, again, translate, reproduce the space-centered cube through all space, what you'll find is that every single lattice point is identical. 
There's no difference between the red and the blue. It's just painted red and blue here so you can see what the face center positions are. And the same thing for the body center cube. And that those are the only three ways you can do this. Okay? There are no other ways in a cubic crystal system to generate a Bravais lattice. Then you can see the others. We have tetragonal. There's two different kinds of tetragonal Bravais lattices, the simple and the body centered. There's only one hexagonal type. There are four orthorhombic types, simple, body centered, base centered, where we just have lattice points at the top and bottom faces, the okay, opposite faces, and face centered orthorhombic, which is just like the face centered cubic, of course, except it's a shoebox instead of a cube. Finally, we have one in the rhombohedral crystal system. We have two different Bravais lattices in monoclinic, the simple and the base centered, and we have only one in the triclinic. The triclinic is the one with the, is the crystal type with the least amount of symmetry, right? basically has no symmetry. Cubic crystal and hex certain hexagonal crystals are those with the most symmetry. Okay. okay, so any crystal that you find in nature will have one of these 14 Bravais lattices. Okay. That doesn't mean that they look this simple. It just means that you can think of the crystal as, as belonging to one of these Bravais lattices. Each, of the lattice point might each lattice point in the crystal might have one or more than one thing, atom, ion, or molecule, associated with it. So you could have a Bravais lattice that's simple cubic where every lattice point has, a, has decorated on it let's say six different molecules or six different atoms. Okay? But you can always decompose it into one of the Bravais lattices. And of course there's an infinite number of different possible crystals that you can find in nature, right? different, different kinds of compounds. But they all fall into one of these 14 Bravais. So that's one of the um, organizing powers here of solid state chemistry. It's already coming out. Let's look at just the cubic lattices to start with, because they're the easiest. They're also some of the most important. So we'll primarily talk about cubic lattices. As I mentioned before, there are three cubic Bravais lattices, the simple, the face-centered, the body-centered. Okay. What can we learn about these things? Well, let's, let's just assign A, B, and C to um, different edges of the unit cell. Right? A, A could be the X, and C is the, is the Z axis. A, B, and C, this is a typical nomenclature, these are called the lattice constants for the unit cell. Okay. And for cube, of course, A is equal to B is equal to C, and so we really have only one lattice constant which we call A. Okay. A is the lattice constant for the unit cell. And A for a, an, an atomic crystal, you know, like uh, a piece of iron, for example, is going to be on the order of maybe three to seven angstroms. Okay. So it's a, there's a very small distance that we're talking about. Of course, it's related to the bonding in the crystal and the size of the atoms and so forth. But three to seven angstroms is pretty, pretty typical. <clears throat> okay, let's look at how many lattice points are present in each of these three cubic lattices. Okay, the simple, the body-centered, and the face-centered. Just so you know, body-centered cubic is often called BCC body center cubic, and face center cubic is also often called FCC. So if I fall into calling things BCC and FCC, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. So one important thing that we need to be able to do is to determine what's actually present in the unit cell. Okay. How many points belong to individual unit cells and to account for this. So if we look at the simple cubic, this is a different three-dimensional drawing of a simple cubic. Right. The cubic uh, lattice points are at the corners of the cube. Each of the corners of the cube, if that were occupied by an atom, okay, that atom would be shared by eight different unit cells. So for example, this point here, okay, this lattice point, would be shared by this unit cell, of course, the three others that are in the plane here, and the four other unit cells that are above. Okay? And so that's why there's just one eighth of a sphere that's painted in to this particular unit cell. In other words, each of the corner positions is shared by eight different unit cells, and so we have eight corner positions. Each one is worth one-eighth, and so we really have one lattice point that's within the simple cube. Okay. So we can say that, yeah, there's, that simple cube owns one lattice point in total. What about the base, or the, sorry, the body-centered cube? So if we look at BCC, we have the same kind of diagram here. We can see that things look a little bit different. The body center position, that atom or ion or molecule is totally within the unit cell. 
So that's owned by that unit cell. Plus we have the eight corner positions. And so we have eight divided by eight for the corners plus one atom at the center or one lattice point at the center. That gives us two lattice points for the BCC. And finally, the FCC looks like this, right? We have face-centered positions. At the face centers, you're going to be shared between two different unit cells, right? Because you're basically cut directly in half. So 50% of each of the face center lattice points is going to belong to one of the unit cells. How many face center positions do we have? We have six. So we have six times 50%, right? That's three atoms from the face centers plus the eight divided by eight from the corners. So the FCC has four lattice points or four atoms within it. Okay. So we have one for the simple cube, we have two for the BCC, the body centered cubic, and we have four for the face centered cubic. Okay, so this is a summary of kind of accounting for the contents of a unit cell. If we have an atom that's at the corner, it's shared between eight, so each atom counts as one eighth and so forth, right? Face center shared between two. Each atom counts for one half. The edge center position, right? That would be shared between four cells. So an edge center position would be like if there was a lattice point right here, okay, on this edge center. And each atom would then count as one fourth. And so we have in the orthorhombic situations, the four different orthorhombic cases, we have one Lattice point for the simple, we have two for the, BC, the uh, body centered version, we have two for the base centered version, and we have four for the face centered version okay, for the unit cell. Are there any questions so far about accounting for unit cell contents? Okay. Okay, so let's move now into descriptions of actual crystal structures. Okay, so we're going to um, understand a little bit more about basic geometry of the, of the crystals and then start talking about well-known and important examples. So let's look first at the contents of a real um, non-trivial crystal here, a crystal that has, in this case, an ionic crystal that has more than one type of atom present. This is a very well-known crystal to you, sodium chloride, which is in the rock salt crystal structure. Okay. And this is a picture of the unit cell of sodium chloride. You can see right away that it's not a brave, simple brave lattice, right? Because if I stand at this position here versus this position here, your world is different, okay? If I stand here, I'm surrounded by these red ions, which are the sodiums, and if I stand at a sodium position, I'm surrounded by chlorine ions, okay? So this is an example of a uh, crystal structure that is described as a brave lattice with um, multiple atoms present on each position. So it's not just a simple brave lattice. Let's account for the atom, the unit cell contents for this uh, particular sodium chloride unit cell. Okay. The blue atoms here, these are chloride. The red ones are sodiums. We can usually tell this because the cations are going to be smaller than the anions in general. Okay. So the chlorines are present at the corners. We have eight of those. Each one is worth one-eighth in this unit cell, so that's one total chlorine. Then we have chlorines at the face centers, and there are six of those. Each one's worth one-half, and so we have three face center chlorines, these six here. Okay. That gives us four chlorines. We right away know how many sodiums there should be because we know the formula unit, right? We know the molecular formula of sodium chloride is sodium one, chlorine one, but we can count it up anyway. If we look at the sodiums, there are sodiums at the edge positions, Right, the edge center positions. There are 12 of those. Each one is worth one fourth because, for example, this edge center position is shared between four unit cells in the plane. Okay. So that's 12 times 0.25. That gives us three. And then we have one additional sodium at the body center position. And that's worth a full sodium. And so we have four sodiums. We have four chlorines. The contents of the unit cell then are four formula units of salt, right. four sodium chloride units. And if we reproduce this unit cell, translating it in all three directions, infinitely through space, we will generate the full crystal of sodium chloride. Okay. So that's the idea behind the, uh, the unit cell concept. Okay. It's the smallest unit that has the, uh, the you know, correct number of atoms when translated gives you the full crystal. Okay, 
So we'll tackle the rest of this on, uh, on Wednesday. Thanks. Are there any questions?